Okay, welcome to a special extended Q&A for the webinar on tackling pests and diseases in cannabis that was presented by Dr. Michael Brownbridge earlier today. We had a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to, so we're going to take the next hour to tackle as many of them as we can. So first question, which nutrients would you use on mother plants 48 hours prior to taking cuttings? Now you see, I was very subtle in my placement of product in that slide. So if you look at the slide carefully, it's there. Actually, uh, a, a full disclosure, I work for Bioworks and this is a Bioworks product, but we have two products, uh, one called OnGuard and the other called OnGuard Calcium. And OnGuard is a, it's a protein hydrolysate in that it's enzymatically dissociated soybean protein broken down into amino acids which can be absorbed very readily by the plant that's why it can be applied as a foliar spray taken up by the plant very very happily <clears throat> we have another product called on guard calcium which is the basic on guard slightly lower night night well let me go back on guard is a five zero zero um, it actually contains nitro nitrogen and a few other elements as well but long story it's all to do with how fertilizers are described and approved not going there um, but then we have one called on guard calcium which is basically on guard supplemented with calcium chloride because the on guard has been shown to enhance uptake of calcium chloride by certainly in ornamentals and that's you know where the example i think i gave for petunia but it's also been done in poinsettia also been done in lettuces because these crops can either be growing so fast like lettuce that it's very hard for all the nutrients to reach those leaf margins uh, and that's why you sometimes see the brown necrosis the brown edges on le on lettuce leaves or uh, uh, um, it's because the calcium doesn't get all the way so the cells don't develop as strongly they die that's where you get the necrotic tissue anyway you've got dead tissue it's a point of entry for pathogens like botrytis um, the on guard calcium is useful uh, because it also I'm going to back up another step. I'm sorry. The on guard used alone with a calcium chloride spray, that movement of amino acids into the plant also takes along calcium chloride, calcium into the plant, into the plant cells. Um, and that's why applying as a foliar spray means you're getting the nutrients exactly where you need them uh, very, very quickly. Now, in the case of the mother plants, this specific question, <clears throat> um, I would uh, contemplate spraying them about 48 hours, 72 hours, or even applying by drench. Uh, it's also very easily taken up by the roots, totally up to, up to you. Um, but what it does, it results, it, it works as a biostimulant almost in that it enhances um, accumulation of carbohydrates in, in the plant in the leaves, in the, 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 the leaf petioles. So when you take cuttings, essentially as our nutrition guy, and I'm, he probably would be going like this with me trying to answer this question for him, but it's what I've gleaned by osmosis and he's super, super, uh, super good at what he does. But essentially you're carbo loading the plant so that when you take the cuttings, they're also carbo loaded, uh, means that they have a lot of energy resources available to them. So when you stick them, that energy is there in the plant and goes directly into root formation, uh, plant growth and development. So you, you typically see superior and faster root formation and growth when you apply that foliar feed. The second benefit is actually to the mother plant itself. These uh, foliar feeds work super well uh, in terms of uh, enabling the plants they're applied to to cope with stress better i've considered spraying myself with it it works that well but i'm joking about that one um, but when you when you apply it to the mother plants 
they're coming into a stressful time. The stress being the removal of those clones. So the more nutrient competent the plant is, the better able it is to deal with that stress and the better it will bounce back from that stress as well. So you're protecting the health of the mother and the child to you to extend that analogy yet again uh, by applying those foliar nutrients to the mother plants. And that then applies through through the whole production phase as well. But you know, cannabis nutrition is a whole ball of wax on its own that it um, should be addressed at some point. And it may already have been uh, somebody talked to in one of these webinars, but essentially using um, these uh, these nutrient supplements, if you will, uh, which which as I said, you can put on by by drip, or you can apply them as part of a tank mix with something, or you can apply them on their own as a foliar spray. If you apply them through the plant's right plant's life, the plant is better equipped to deal with stress situations, whatever that stress may be, and that includes being better able to tolerate pests and diseases too. So it's a whole, I'm not going to repeat, I already said it at the beginning of the webinar, but but it is super important. And uh, But using foliar sprays avoids applying synthetic uh, fertilizers. Yeah. Um, so you don't risk getting that salt buildup either in the surface of the growing medium or in the medium such that you have to then flush the growing medium to just reduce the EC in that medium. So foliar allows you to, we think, and this is not 100% science yet, but uh, reduce your soluble salt inputs um, by using these supplements and not such that say, you, I don't know, say your EC target is, I don't know, 200 parts per million, whatever. Um, we can reduce it significantly without, say, reducing the inputs by half and then applying half by foliar. You can act, you can actually do a lot of things. You don't. It's not a a one for one trade off if you apply by foliar. Just that the plant can access these nutrients more efficiently, um, and it helps again uptake of nutrients from from the soil too. So there's a lot of benefits all around and. Uh, if whoever put the question in is interested, please you know go to the BioWorks website <clears throat> uh, and do some reading on on guard on guard calcium, and then follow up with a call. We have to um, talk you through the process. Okay, um, you might be able to share your screen if you wanted to to go back to any of the slides. Yep, only if you let me. I have let you. Ooh, do you want me to? Well. It's up to there you if, if it'll help um, facilitate um, the answer to the question, please feel free. All right. Okay, so next we have uh, a question about plants coming from another facility. This producer is saying that they constantly get clone trays full of bugs. What is the best treatment? <laughs> This is Legal a very treatment. Good <laughs> uh, use another propagator. Uh, you know, at some point, I think there's got to be a conversation between the people receiving the cuttings and the people sending them. So, say so this is just not acceptable. I realize um, in the real world that's not always possible. You have to deal with what you get. But I think more attention should be paid to propagators. You know, in in the in the ornamentals world. Uh, we've had this back and forth with the major propagators. I think they're doing an awful lot better job now than they ever had in the floriculture side. It will eventually, I, I'm sure, trans transfer to cannabis as well, cannabis or hemp. Um, what can you do if you constantly get them? If, if um, complaining back to the propagator should be part of your response, I think. Um, I would always advocate dipping those cuttings before sticking them. Um, unfortunately, um, Suffoil X, it's approved for dipping floriculture cuttings, but it's not yet approved for dipping cannabis cuttings. We know in floriculture <coughs> that 
it does an absolutely fantastic job against aphids, mites, and thrips, and even eggs of mites, even eggs of Western flower thrips that are laid inside plant tissue. So, but it's not on the, it's not approved yet uh, by Health Canada as a, as a dip. So what does that leave you with? Um, <clears throat> there's, there's two options. Botanigard is one of them. Um, I'm not sure about the Biocera's label, whether it's approved yet for dipping. I think it is, but the Bavaria Bassiana products, let's just say, but check the label. I would definitely dip in Botanigard. I would highly recommend um, incorporating uh, insecticidal soap in with that as a wetting agent because insecticidal soap, again, that might be going off label use. You have to check the label for insecticidal soap. I'm sorry to get sort of into the label stuff, but it's, it's, uh, it's the law. Um, if you can use insecticidal soap, Botanigard plus about a point five, certainly no more, uh, volume, volume concentration of insecticidal soap will um, result in a, a significant reduction of aphids and thrips, but it doesn't really do a whole lot of spider mites. And then root aphids, whole different ball of wax there. And that's where the early drenching of the, uh, once the um, cuttings are stuck, if you're using uh, rooting cubes, and a lot, of, a lot of growers do use rooting cubes, you know, allow those roots to develop about seven days, <clears throat> then go in with a botanigard or a Biocerus drench. Thoroughly wet that cube. Again, I, if you look through the presentation again, I, I do touch on this in the presentation, but apply it, apply it a week, five days later, apply it again. The, the, the reason for the repeated application um, requirement is that you're not going to get 100% contact and kill from one application. You're always going to be some survivors, so you've got to do it again, you've got to do it again. And reducing that interval between applications means that you're not allowing... Aphids are ridiculous in the speed at which they can increase populations. All of the big pests are, you know. So by shortening that interval between applications, um, you make sure you're really knocking down the population, knocking down the population, knocking down the population, not allowing it to build, knock a few more, build, knock a few more down. So you really want to reduce the interval and, and potentially use a high rate as well for a finite time and then go back to a, a, a lower drench rate, longer application interval. So, um, that's rude aphids. Okay. Should say and add the uh, if plant pathogens are a concern, that's where the hydrogen peroxide dip, use of xerotol as a dip, and that is on the label, uh, comes in. That'll basically um, eliminate any microbes on the surface of that cutting, that clone. Doesn't work systemically and that's where i would highly recommend again to send some of that plant material off for testing because that if that disease is already inside that plant there's nothing we have available to us um, that is going to cure that plant even in conventional production systems and not talking cannabis there's there's relatively few products will will cure a plant there are some systemics which work and that's because they're systemics we don't have anything like that uh, approved for use in cannabis. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just keep working our way down. Um, <laughs> this is going to take till midnight, isn't it? <laughs> I'll be less verbose. <laughs> That'll be part three, folks. How do you feel? <laughs> we start How charging for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about using UVC as a disinfectant for sterilizing rooms, plants? Yeah. Or on people? Yeah. I think uh, people know. Um, <laughs> yeah, UVC can work. I, I'm not super familiar with it. I know they have been testing it for quite a while uh, in Ontario. Um, I don't know how well it works. It seems that it. It's, it's one of those things. Um, 
I think we all want a silver bullet. Uh, alas, there isn't such a thing uh, as far as plant protection is concerned. So it might be part of an integrated program. Um, I know they're testing it currently in uh, Cornell and University of Vermont as a means of, you know, you move the UV lights over the crop. Typically, they're like on a gantry system. And uh, certainly, in, in, in they, they will help reduce levels of powdery mildew spores that are present, you know, other, other fungal spores which are just floating around. So, so yeah, they can do a decent, an okay job. But again, it's not, let's do this and then we don't have to worry about anything else. But it's, it's, it is potentially something in a specified area, like um, in, a, in a propagation room or in, a, in, a, um, in the mother plants, it's something to think about because it's a relatively small area. So the costs are not so high. Uh, and you're, you're at that pace, I say, you know, mother plants, is, it's, that's your investment. That's, that's the bank you keep going back to. So you really want to look after them different kind of plant parenting right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, has there been literature that suggests reductions in cannabinoid production due to promoting salicylic acid defense pathways? That's a really good question. And I, I can't give you an example off the top of my head. So I'm, I'm not even going to try. We do know that a lot of plant stress responses can result in increased production of certain com desirable compounds in a plant. Um, but I don't know specifically. So I, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have an answer to that one. I'll put it on my to-do list and find out. All right. Next up, cannabis aphids. This producer is saying that it's their biggest problem. Um, using Cephoil X at 2% has not been effective. Do you have any suggestions? And they've also been using both eggs and larvae of lace wings. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, <clears throat> two suggestions, potentially. Cephoil at 2% should kill cannabis aphid. The problem, as I mentioned earlier, with all aphids is they reproduce parthenogenetically. You know, the, the mothers just keep pumping out live young so quickly. So to get that under control, you really need to hit them, hit them hard. And that's where I think soft oil can do a job. Uh, insecticidal soap is something else which can, can, can work and maybe soft oil soap in rotation. Um, Spray coverage is probably one of the most underrated aspects of applying a pesticide though, because aphids typically are found on the underside of plant leaves. So you have to get sprays to where the aphids are. And they're typically, hit, you know, if this is a leaf, here they are, right under here. Where are you spraying from? Down like this typically. It's, you're getting great coverage on top of the leaf, but that product is not gonna move through the leaf and get the aphids underneath. And that's why um, having good sprayers, if you can get nozzles which target that spray upwards and into the canopy, or at least sideways into the canopy, that can really, really help. And, and, and that's where I think some of the foggers can come in, but then you can't apply soft oil, or, and I don't think you should apply uh, soap either through a fogger. So nix that as an option. Um, so getting, a hydraulic type sprayer which can put out fine spray droplets rather than a heavy wet spray is probably going to be better uh, because those fine droplets will move into that canopy better you get better underleaf coverage you get better underleaf coverage you should get better control of the aphids so again it goes back to investing in good spray equipment i think is is probably uh, uh, so important um, the other thing, um, <clears throat> lace wings can do a lot of feeding, but um, also getting them to stick around in a crop sometimes is really, really hard. So that they will, you can introduce them, they wander off, they find a, 
uh, an infested leaf, they'll feed away for a little while, then they'll move on elsewhere. Even if they leave two or three behind, that's the nucleus for a, a whole new population growth there. So that's not always the best way. I, 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 I think perhaps a combination of lace wings with um, aphid parasitoids can be the way to go. And again, I think for uh, for cannabis aphid, I'll just I think it's, I think it's Aphidius irvi is is the better one to use for cannabis aphid. Yeah, uh, you did mention that in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, and it's super important to uh, choose the right Aphidius species for yeah here we go for the aphid in question. So. All right, yeah. So, uh, aphid control, yeah. Where did I get to? Okay. Anyway, yeah, Aphidia servi is the one to use for aphids, but it, yes, here we go. Uh, cannabis aphid, potato aphid, foxglove aphid, Aphidia servi. Mm -hmm. And then again, it, it will establish should establish in the crop um, <clears throat> um, but you have to release them every week and there's a rate specified in in, a, in any guide you get and it's again it's it's the rate the release rate is is in the presentation mm. do you want to share my screen quickly for that one sure yeah let's do that yeah because we can talk to some of the other stuff yeah. how do i share my screen share screen there we go uh Oh, there we are. Let's go into full screen mode. Can you see that? Greta, can you see that okay? Hello? Nope, it's not. Uh... Not there? Why is that? That's weird. Hold on, I'll try again then. Uh, I thought I was sharing screen two then. Let's try that one. Oh, you know what? Yeah, try this. Oh. Yes. It started. Oh, there we are. Yes, I see it. Okay. So if I go into sort of full screen mode. There we are. Um, I think if I even go to the next slide, it's even better. Oh, no. Okay, so <clears throat> cannabis aphid, these are what they call large aphids. So Aphidia cervi, um, excellent aphid parasite, parasitoid works against all of these. And that's where identification of your aphid is so, so important because um, you want to be sure, it, and, and cannabis aphid is, is quite distinctive uh, in, in, its, in its morphology. Um, the other predatory species is Phytolides, and that's in the bottom of those two pictures there, those little uh, pinkish colored and the large sort of yellowy green color, colored uh, maggots um, are Phytolides immatures. Um, and they, <laughs> very neat, they attack aphids and they sort of puncture their legs and basically um, use the leg as a straw to suck out all the all the body contents through that and the aphid will slowly go down and dry down that might be something that works as an alternative to to uh, lacewing to chrysoperla um, if you're using biocontrol agents uh, together with the soap and oil good coverage between those you should get control of aphids but it is problematic and i fully appreciate the challenges in cannabis crops when they're so dense and the foliage is so dense and the plants are grown so closely together um, that that is a real challenge this is probably one of the biggest uh, challenges out now are, are, are aphids to control in cannabis so these are some amazing action shots by the way <laughs> they're good aren't they uh -huh. yeah. yeah 
Okay. Yeah, but again, it's a, it's a work in progress. I mean, a work in progress, that's the wrong word to use. It's a process. Um, you have to release these parasitoids early and they will become established, should become established over time. Uh, so it's a constant reintroduction into that greenhouse. So, mm -hmm. but again, um, you know, it's understanding not only your pest, but understanding your, your biocontrol agent as well as right. What conditions does it work well? under temperature light humidity what conditions does it not work well under are you providing the right conditions for it to work well so these are all things rather than just buying something because somebody says so or throwing it into a crop you know you have to get the right environment the right natural enemy and have identified the pest correctly so those three things have to be done right for, for biocontrol to work really really well okay all right, switching gears a little bit. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah. If you find uh, signs of disease, how much time does a producer have to react to it before it becomes damaging? <laughs> I would respond this way. If you can see signs of the disease, it's probably already too late. Um, because symptoms typically the infection is there once the plant really starts to show those symptoms it, it's often too late and that's why you may not see anything but it's important you know just make make a leap of faith if you will because we've shown it so many times uh, in, in other crops the disease will be there it will arrive assume that take preventative steps because all of these preventatives work best when populations be it pest or disease when those populations or the inoculum levels are are low and they will provide protection to the plant and a lot of the materials that are available you know i'll, I'll, I'll go back for the root diseases for example root shield and pre-stop for example are, are they can be applied at at very cost effective rates and then it's not just you apply it and it's gone in two days these are living organisms which you're applying and they will colonize the roots and they'll give you anywhere sort of from let's say three to eight weeks of protection so it's not like you're applying every week you can apply through a cannabis production cycle you may apply twice three times if you're taking care at, at propagation i would go there stepping up and then once again so maybe three times in that whole life of that crop <clears throat> it's uh it's again I, I i what's what's your crop worth um if you let that disease develop two things are going to happen one you the plant's going to die or the best case production and quality is going to be compromised significantly the longer you leave that disease plant in a crop if it comes to it you know you're just risking infection to everything else that's that's around it. So I would say prevention is one thing. If you start to see disease, um, what actions can you take? Sometimes it's too late. The only disease where you can take curative action is mildew. But again, be curative early in that disease development. And that's where using the potassium bicarbonate sprays, uh, Millstop or Sirocco can work well. Yes, they have preventative rates and curative rates and it's you know you can go in and cure a crop but that's probably the only curative tool that we have for cannabis right now um if nothing works if you're too late then the only recourse i think is actually roguing plants out as well it has and that's hard to do oh my gosh it's hard enough with guys throwing out you know bedding plants for goodness sake i can only imagine what it's like if you have to well take out um, and take it out as cautiously as possible but sometimes roguing is the only way forward and that's um, you know there are quite a few viruses starting to show up in in cannabis now um, no cures for viruses the only thing you can do is remove it so you're removing source of infection for the rest of the plants but uh, you know again taking care of that right up front preventing diseases happening right up front and it goes again how many times did i say it 
prevention, sanitation, and it applies across the board. And that, that, those, are, those are the best tools that we have. Those are really, in many respects, the only tools that we have uh, uh, for cannabis production. Okay. Sorry, there's no better news there. No, I mean, the best method is prevention for many things, always, even outside always. of greenhouse production. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard that how many times? Um, have you seen evidence of fusarium graminearum in cannabis inflorescences? Personally, mm. I have not. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I've not seen it. Okay. Fusarium is one of those funny organisms. You can see it, you know, as a soil borne disease, as a, as a disease of, of in the stems and things like that and then some maybe is in the flowers um all i know is a lot of fusarium species have very wide host ranges uh cannabis to them is oh look here's another host um that wasn't previously grown necessarily but now it is and if it's out there it's going to come in so again what's that p word prevention um yeah so it could be. I don't know. Uh, that's something I would have to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of a deeper dig into okay. to find out that information. What would you suggest for botrytis control in flowers? Um, botrytis is a hard one. There's nothing registered for control. There are several options uh, registered for suppression, um, and I can. Whoops. If you want, I'll, I'll pull up that slide again as well. It's, it's two slides, but it's easier to, I think, talk through it here. Mm -hmm. uh, share screen. Okay. Do you have that one screen up, Greta? Yes. yes? Perfect. All right. Um, okay. Flowering to harvest. This is, this is the tricky time because with uh you know the 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 pistols and the trichomes in the flowers that's where the good stuff is so you don't want to risk burning those and we know that certainly at, at high rates some of the uh, you know potassium bicarbonate um can damage trichomes that it doesn't always um uh, it's probably linked to temperature and all sorts of environmental conditions as well we have had growers use um, potassium bicarbonate millstop and soft oil X practically up until harvest with no, no adverse side effects. But I would say you've got to be real careful about using those. So our general recommendation is, is to not use them within three weeks of harvest. Um, so that still leaves you three weeks to either bite your fingernails all the way down or um, think about, well, what else, what else could I use? Um, is there really the only materials that can provide some degree of botrytis suppression? There's the Regalia Max, and that's the one that activates the plant's own defenses. Um, good product. Um, does it translate into the flower? Not sure. Uh, root shield HC, again, this is trichoderma, um, foliar spray, but again, uh, uh, and ditto for pre stop, that's the gliocladium. Um, stop those sprays three to four weeks, three weeks prior to harvest, because you don't want to just be putting um, microbes into the flowers because they will show up in the test. Uh, Mill stop Sirocco, that's potassium bicarbonate. Um, and this is where you know, back to the first question about the uh, the plant supplements. This is where on guard calcium we think could could help in this regard as well, because it gets down to <clears throat> enhanced calcium uptake by parts of the plant which typically have problems moving calcium into the cell walls, so the cell walls can be weaker. Botrytis loves to go into compromised tissue to senescing plant tissue that's where botrytis gets a foothold so the healthier you can make that tissue um, the more tolerant it's going to be the more 
um, able it is going to be to resist infection by something like botrytis. And then the other tools can, can help on top of that. So I, I think nutrition in cases like this is probably part of that uh, prevention program again, uh, rather than sort of pushing plants too hard to get bigger, bigger flowers. And then we know that standard practice in many cases, understandably again, but it oftentimes leads to weaker cells. So um, if you can cut back on, on some, of the, um, some of the nutrients, is that, is that realistic? Maybe it's not. Um, so it makes it even more important then to get some of those nutrient supplements to improve uh, calcium uptake by those, by those plant tissues. And that, that's why I don't, I don't know if everybody saw the announcement by Health Canada around being able to apply uh, foliar nutrients now and apply certain products by, by foliar spray. It's, um, it's an important ruling that has a lot of implications to cases like this specifically, you know, where, where you need to get extra calcium into those susceptible tissues. So there's, again, there's no one way, I don't think, that is, is going to get rid of botrytis. Again, all of these can help prevent suppress botrytis happening and that that's what we can do nothing is going to cure it okay mm -hmm. all right so we're going to wander back into bcas um, <laughs> uh, in terms of an extreme infestation of spider mites do you have a recommendation in terms of um, how dense the predatory mites should be in terms of uh, per square meter? Uh, there are there are cases where I would say that's where using a spray, something like uh, soft oil or or pure spray. I, I'm, I'm being partisan because I think soft oil is is a really good product and it does work super well against mites why would you use both if the populations are so high it's again getting back to you know you've got to use multiple tools together in an ipm program but this the predator on its own will be doing a great job perhaps and it's eating you know tens of of spider mites every single day but the population is so huge that it doesn't really bring it under control within a time, in a timely manner. And that's where you need to use something like a, a soft oil spray to really knock those pest populations down. And maybe even do two or three soft oil sprays, knock the populations back, then introduce your persimilis into, you, into those hot spots. Persimilis is, is a phenomenal predator. Uh, it really, really does a great job and it will clean up hot spots. Um, obviously, the sooner you get into those areas, the better results you're going to see, the less treatments you have to apply. Um, so again, it, it's a matter of getting into the crop, scouting. If, you, if you're starting to see webbing, that should be like, oh my God, I've got to do this now. There is no time to waste. Um, if you've got thick webbing, like spooky movie, you know, Halloween spider webbing all over your plant, good luck. Um, it, it, Again, I hate to say it, but it might be time. Just it's too late. Um, maybe, yeah. What could you do then? Just remove the plant, but still follow through with those with those uh, uh, soft oil sprays with the release of persimilis. But you know, honestly, the, the the key is to try and prevent that happening, and that means good crop scouting, regular crop scouting. Uh, an ability to recognize, you know, what spider mite feeding damage looks like on a leaf, and it's quite distinctive. Um, and then don't wait a few days, take steps immediately if you need to. But uh, again, the whole point of the preventative program is to stop that happening. You don't get, it, it's, it's easy, I think, sometimes to get comfortable. Oh, it's working. You walk away, but you know spider mites another one of those pests which can um, 
almost quadruple overnight it seems you know and and that's a ridiculous rate of rate of increase or the potential rate of population increase so for every day you wait it's already doubled its population you know so don't take steps i, I think it you know the, one of the points i was trying to make at the beginning as well is is planning 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 you should have that program planned before anything even goes into a pot or a cube or anything like that it, it now is when next year's production plans should be being made so you know what to do ask those what if questions what are you going to do and it, it allows you to be more proactive and i think in in sort of um knowing what you're going to do uh more proactive in terms of understanding what you what you need to do where you need to go and the tools you need potentially to bring in to take care of that situation but you know the, the thing with any biocontrol strategy using predators you can place an order today it doesn't arrive tomorrow it'll arrive you know maybe it's four days five days a week later so that's another factor you have to build in within time of order time of receipt you know say you've got five days goes by and in a, in a life of a spider mite that's like oh yeah we've had kids the kids have had kids the kids have had kids the kids have had kids boom so you've gone from a, a small problem to a large problem very very quickly so preemptive planning is always a good thing to do okay we're going to head into our last couple of questions um do you think the success rate of aureus improves with the use of supplemental nutrition such as uh Festi eggs yeah, I do. Nutrimite's a, a, a good one as well. That's a pollen supplement. Um, there's a Festia eggs and there is, um, I'm not sure if, I don't think you can get these in Canada, so I'm not, no, I don't think you can. A Festia eggs and Nutrimite, I know you can, which is uh, pollen from Tifa, which is um, cattail. Uh, and a Festia eggs work beautifully. The nice thing, Aureus is a generalist, so it'll, if it can't find a prey organism to eat, it will feed whatever it, it finds. If that's pollen, if that's a festia eggs, yes, they will, they will establish better. <clears throat> it, essentially, you're, you're providing resources to our Aureus to stick around, to encourage Aureus to stick around, to encourage Aureus uh, populations potentially to grow as well. But Aureus as well, you know, the, the time of year you release Aureus is gonna have a huge bearing on, on whether they will establish or not. They, they do typically go into some sort of diapause once the day length gets below a certain number of daylight hours in that day. And I, I mentioned this like uh, four to five months of the year where Aureus just doesn't wanna know. So, um, it's one of those things as well. Yes, the supplemental feeding. Also, uh, use of uh, banker plants uh, have proven to be very, very successful too. But that it, banker plants is not my. Let's use banker plants first. You know that that requires a degree of experience. I think in in use of biocontrol before you can start to use banker plants. Once you start to use them, they can be hugely effective as a as a in terms of providing. Um, a consistent supply of natural enemies like aureus into the crop providing a, a place where aureus can breed and increase in the absence of prey potentially in the crop so but that's you know once you've gone through uh biocontrol 101 and then the advanced level it's the it's the next level to get into certainly we would love people to get to that point um and it, and it can work superbly well in many crops and, and cannabis no exception but it's it's it does require a whole different level of organization and um, planning because you don't have to now just grow your cannabis crops you have to grow your um, uh, banker plants as well that have to be flowering at the stage when you want to introduce them and you have to be able to have a constant supply so now you're producing cannabis you're also producing banker plants as well so there's a whole timing um, process that you, you have to think through as well so it, it is a little more complex but it can work very very well so i mean that's the ultimate in the interim what what the supplemental foods do is they're just in place of a banker plant you can put supplemental foods into the crop yeah so they can help 
Now, do the supplements. Oh, that was a long <laughs> answer for, for an easy yes no question. No, it? that's, I think you brought up a great topic banker plans. Mm -hmm. um, do the supplemental foods have to be approved for specific crops? Good question. Don't honestly know. Mm -hmm. I, part of me says I don't think so. Why would you? Um, but maybe check it out. Um, yeah, I would place a few calls to mm -hmm. my plant product supplier and ask them to the to the biocontrol expert and say, can, can I put pollen in? Um, that would be a call I would place to them or Terry okay. in that manner. Got it. Okay, last one, just to wrap it all up. Yep. Uh, you know, the webinar was very um, focused on preventative steps and there are so many. And so many I was going to say, be polite, Greta. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are just so many, so many options and, and so many preventative steps. But how would a producer yeah. know which ones to use which ones? in advance of the problem because they don't know what the problem is going to be? Yep, I think and this is part of the problem, you know, because cannabis production at scale, at the scales we're growing it now, is only what two years, three years old now. So we really don't know. We don't know, this sounds Rumsfeldian, but we don't know what we don't know yet. We're still in that, I think, learning process, very much so. But I think there's a lot of lessons can be just transferred from what we've learned in, in floriculture, just other flowers, let's face it, can be transferred over to, to cannabis, you know. And, and I think um, the understanding is that, you know, you will get pests, you will get diseases if you accept that and prior experience in even in cannabis short as it is I, i'm sure many girls say oh yeah we have this this and this is our primary problems are you keeping good records do you know when this problem showed up do you know where that problem was did you get it in your propagation room that says to me then you know hey we need to tighten up procedures in the propagation room was it at a certain time point through that, that production period? Was it, was it at a certain time of year? All of these pieces, if, if you look at it as sort of like a mystery, you start to piece these together and you get a clearer picture of what pest you have and when, what diseases you have and when. And with that knowledge, you can start to plan your IPM program around it. Or you make assumptions that certain pests will occur. If they don't appear, then you can plan for it but you don't have to sort of pull the trigger and, and, and do it. Um, I, I would say three things to count on. You're going to get aphids. You're probably going to get some form of mite. You are going to get powdery mildew. You are going to get root diseases, the challenge with root diseases. Make those four assumptions, plan around that with contingencies around some of the other pests perhaps. And, and then go full steam on that preventative program. Um, if you don't have pest or disease issues under that program, you can do one of two things. One is say, why did I do all that? I didn't get pests and diseases. But maybe you didn't get pests and diseases because you were doing that. So don't stop doing everything until you know. But it, once that confidence comes of, of using certain things, I think that's the point at which you understand to some degree, crop dynamics, how they associate with pest dynamics, how they associate with climate, with environmental controls, et cetera. You may start to be able to pull out some of those pieces. It's like a Jenga puzzle. Which can I pull out and it still stays standing? But um, do it piece by piece. This, this is how the, uh, you know, Ontario's floriculture industry, for example, has, they're, they're you know, light years ahead in my view of, of uh, many, many, uh, many countries in terms of the sophistication and the degree to which they use biocontrol um, because of the experience and that let's use everything and then we'll stop you we'll, little by little, we'll see what we can do without. And, and that's the only way forward. You know, it's, it's there's no quick and easy. <clears throat> you know, I, I want to, without going into an absolutely exhaustive list of all of the um, biocontrol options that are potentially out there. Um, I, I wanted to 
give representation to the ones which we know work, the ones which we know work in cannabis, and the ones which we know sort of play well together and aren't too badly affected by the biopesticides that we have at our disposal. Or if they are affected, we know how we can go back in and reintroduce them. So, um, and I think that's what biocontrol is all about. You don't have to use all of them. Those are the options. And I think it's every location is, is going to see success with some things, failure with other things that work really well in another location. It's a matter of finding what works for your specific location, your specific cannabis varieties, your, you know, whatever else, um, and make it work for you. And, and, and that's where there's anybody that says, you know, here's how you can do it, I think is, is to some degree not telling you the whole truth. Um, there are certain, I would say, foundational elements I would put into a biocontrol program, <clears throat> but it always needs consistent tweaking to make it work as well as it can work in a specific location. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, there are still actually a number of questions, but I'm actually going to send these to you because they are more product focused about specific use of the products or compatibility. And then yep. that way yourself or a team member can follow up. Um, Certainly with them personally. will do. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And, oh, you're welcome. Uh, so here's a pun. Mm -hmm. Will this go on as an annex to the main presentation? Did you get that? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Eh? Oh. Shall we explain that one while we're still on air? <laughs> because Treehouse Canada is owned by Annex Business Media. Ta da! <laughs> anyway. <laughs> if only I had a logo. Ah, I know I should have one behind me, but I need the green screen. Yes, yes. Okay, well, All have right. a good one. Thank you, Greta. Pleasure, as always. And, um, one of these days, I'll see you outside of the, uh, the yeah. confines of a Zoom meeting or a go to. <laughs> Here's hoping. Here's hoping. See All ya. Right. Take care.